Mr. Phil McCoy, financial Phil himself. Philly, good morning to you. Good morning, guys. How are you all? Very well. Thank you, Phil. Just splendid, Phil. Nice day out today. The sun's getting in my eyes a little bit, but a a nice day out today. Yeah, the initial forecast was for it to be a little little gray and funky today, but it's uh, actually turned into be a pretty nice morning. Did you see the sunrise by chance, Phil? Uh, Today I did not. It's the old story of... Red in the morning, sailor take warning. The sailors be petrified after seeing this morning sunrise. It was spectacular. Well, red sunrise is bad. Yeah, that's what the old saying is. Red, really? Red in the morning, sailors take warning. Red at night, sailors delight. Yeah, I knew there was some kind of rhyme with that. I yeah. could never remember yeah. what it was. Mm-hmm. But uh, I, any idea why they thought red in the morning was a problem? It's all the atmospheric uh, conditions, how the sun uh, reflects on the, on the clouds. It's, a, it's good for a short-term forecast. It's not like the old uh, uh, here in, uh, the, uh, the fish scales that three or four days down the line. The red in the morning is for the next 24 hours or so. So uh, for those of you who are new to the area and just kind of tuning in and figuring the show out a little bit, Bill is a retired admiral, sailed the seven seas. He was president of the Berkeley County Commission. And uh, my question to you, Bill, is uh, where in the world is the best sunset? The most interesting sun- sunset is without the sunsets at all. Uh, it's the uh, when you own the seas, most notably in the Pacific, but sometimes in the Atlantic, you have what's called a green flash. But it has to be basically cloud-free. The horizon has to be clear. And as the sun is setting, that microsecond, once it goes beneath the horizon, the, the, cloud, the sky turns green. And uh, you don't see it often, uh, but when you do see it, it's quite spectacular. Hmm. I've, I've never heard of that. Phil, have you heard of the old green sky? The green flash. Green I flash. have not. Yeah, okay. I, I'm not uh, I have not. Well, look it up. It's a it's a real phenomenon, and there, it has been caught by uh, with, with cameras. Uh, and on a ship, uh, go and see. There's not a lot to do. Uh, most everyone's on the uh, on ab- above decks at sunset just to talk and to visit and enjoy uh, enjoy memories of the day. Uh, but everybody is looking toward the western sky, hoping to see the green flash. Uh, I've seen it maybe. 10 to 15 times, but that's out of thousands, out of many, many hundreds of days looking at the sky. Sounds like a Marvel comic superhero. It was, yeah. The The green green flash flash comes a running. Uh, Phil, uh, no Steeler game this past weekend, but uh, I I know you're busy with volleyball, but that Cleveland Brown San Francisco game was something, man. I mean, uh, 49ers kicker missed a field goal to you. Yeah, and I, was, I saw the end of it, and I was surprised um, that, of course, Cleveland won. But kind of sad that here in the AFC North, all those guys won. So it Free kind of pushes our Steelers back a little bit. Yeah, so it kind of pushes our guys back a little bit. But that was a big win. And to take, you know, I always dismiss Cleveland as being Cleveland, but they've got their defense is nasty. I mean, that's that's a solid, solid Very defense. good defense. But and what they a- won with the uh, P.J. Walker, who got yeah. cut for in favor of of uh, uh, Bajan, so that was that was impressive to win with a uh, you know someone they had just recently signed. And so Bajan that was, that was got in this win. weekend. Ba- too. Bajan played basically the he second. Did. Yeah, played most of the second half. Uh, scored a uh, uh, scored a touchdown. His first touchdown. Gave one up too. I'm sorry. Gave one up too. Got strip sacked. Well, oh, he did. Yeah. He, yeah. He, yeah. I don't know that you can fully oh, blame yeah. blame him for that, but the. Uh, yeah, I mean, he looked good throwing the ball, and it sounds like he's going to get to play next week, too. So That's pretty cool. That's yeah. uh, exciting for him. But he, he looked – that you could tell that the the fans in Chicago are are on his side. I mean, they he immediately they kind of came to life. And he had, he had two really nice drives. The, uh, the last throw that was picked kind of stung a little bit. But when you look at his stat line for the first time coming in without notice, you know, of course, you always got to be ready as, as the backup quarterback. But Kevin, I think he was ten for fourteen for eighty-five yards or so, and yep. and had a sneak for a touchdown. He made some big third third down. You know, most of those ten completions were big third down, and he was under duress. He'd run out of the pocket, so it's a nice place from he. I mean, he did. I thought he looked good. He, he had to pick, but but whatever, he, he looked good. He he held held his own. I I, I thought. And how I watched about, it. I was I was watching. It. And what about the Jets over the uh, the Philadelphia Eagles? That, that, not yeah, that so was the other one beaten one. Out, yeah. Both of those, probably. Yeah. 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 
Yeah, both of those are probably. But it's the NFL. You know, it's funny. You know, you look at the NFL and think, oh, well, someone like the Jets could never beat the Eagles or the Cardinals could never beat the Cowboys and back and forth. But those guys are so close in, in talent and ability. And so you, you get that on, on any week where it's a little different in college, I guess, so you have those huge point spreads and, and you, you kind of know that JMU is not going to beat Georgia sort of thing. But, but in the NFL, it, it's, it's every week. And those guys could uh, – uh, the 0-5 the teams could beat a 5-0 and o team on any given Sunday. I just saw Damon Wright's comment on Facebook talking about the green flash. Damon says, I've heard it. Are we sure Bill isn't talking about when he used to streak on the ship? Yeah. <laughs> Is that your nickname, Bill? With, with, my, with my speed, I would not be streaking very fast. <laughs> would, there'd be no flash. <laughs> oh, that's too good, man. The green, Bill, Bill Stubblefield, the new green flash. I, I looked out, uh, I was watching the last uh, quarter of the San Francisco Cleveland game. And when the San Francisco kicker came out for that field goal at the end, first and foremost, uh, I, I thought Kyle, Kyle Shanahan botched that series at the end there. They were down to the 21. I think they had 35, 36 seconds left, still had a timeout. And then they basically played to roll out, run out the clock, take a knee, which gave up another two or three yards, and center the ball, which was already pretty centered anyway. And I think that was inexperience in Cleveland because as a Steelers fan, you know, it's a divisional rival, so you go there every single year. And you know when you play in Cleveland, especially this time of the year, the wind is coming in off that lake. It's unpredictable. A field goal of over 40 yards is not a gimme in Cleveland. As, as any Northeast team, in, in once you start to get into this time of the year, you don't know what the ball is going to do. And I thought, man, he, he's messing this up. He, I thought he should have tried to get a little bit closer since he still had a timeout in his pocket. And then they showed that kicker's face when he comes in from the sideline. And, and I've looked, I looked at his face. And I said to my son, he's going to miss this kick. Look at his face. This is like the last place he wants to be on earth right now is having to make this kick. They got a 3,000-mile flight back if he misses it. And all he's going to be able to do is think about how he blew the game. And that's got to be on his mind right now. And sure enough, he pushed it to the right. And it was bad from the time it left his foot. That's on the kicker. But I thought it was on his head coach, too, for putting him in that situation in Cleveland when the wind was whipping the way it was. Yeah. Rob, let me shift gears very quickly before we get into finances. You and I were talking before the show started, 60 Minutes last night. There was a segment on, six, on 60 Minutes, Phil. I don't know if you saw it or not, but it was the uh, during the Hamas attack uh, on, uh, on the villages. Uh, a, uh, a, a young man and his wife and the two very young kids, one and three years old, were caught in what they call the safe room and terrorists all around them. He called his father. Uh, his father was a retired uh, major general in the Israeli army. The farmer, I mean, the, the retired general and his wife hopped in their jeep. The guy uh, uh, grabbed a couple of guns. They went to rescue the son and his family uh, from uh, driving from uh, Jerusalem. They, uh, uh, in the process, they rescued two or three other people and got them to safety. Uh, and they also killed one of the terrorists. But then this this elderly, not elderly, he's probably in uh, late 60s, early 70s, fellow came to the rescue of his son and the family. It was something out of the movies. It was a true story. It was actually something out of the movies. If you did not see that, if you have an opportunity to see that clip, it was quite, uh, it was, uh, uh, quite emotional watching this gentleman go take battle, go to battle stations to rescue his family. Uh, I did not see it. Yeah. It'd be cool to see that. I, I, I yeah. think I think with TV these days, I, you could go back and watch that. Yeah, I think we'll you can too. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Phil, let's talk money here. Let's do it. All right, let's get into it. Uh, Friday was a tough day for the markets, and uh, today we are in positive territory with the futures. So are we starting to focus on uh, earnings? Are we still focusing on uh, yeah, war around so the world, or are we looking at inflation still? Friday. Friday, all of them. Uh, Friday was it was a tough day for the Nasdaq. I think the S and P and Dow squeaked out small gains, but it was a tough day for tech companies. Yeah, they, they the, really Phil, the, the Dow the line. Dow gained an eighth of a percent, but the S and P lost a half percent. Nasdaq lost one and a gotcha. quarter. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it couldn't really put my finger on why, and and, and Al's out of town as well, so I didn't have my 
I didn't I didn't have my whereabouts with me in some cases I was just working off my phone. But this week we're looking at there's a lot of earnings. So it's earnings season and I think it's a welcome reprieve from the same old, same old which is talking about inflation, which of course leads us to the Federal Reserve and even, you know, the wars that we're looking at and all the horrific things that we're hearing about overseas, all of that as far as our markets are concerned just kind of pushes us toward what does the Federal Reserve think of this, and, and, it, and it really is that. It funnels down to the Federal Reserve and what their action or lack thereof may be. So this week when we have company earnings, it's, it's going to be short-lived, but it is going to be a reprieve or there's something else in the headlines that we could focus on. Really, all that matters in the long run is how companies are performing and our expectations that the the experts' expectations of what the companies in the S&P are going to be is kind of flat in comparison to last year. So the as these come out, that would be something that would move us on a short-term basis and maybe sector-specific or asset class-specific based off what a company does. For example, if Google uh, were to blow out expectations, where John often says a rising tide raises all ships, where, where uh, the – Microsoft and the Apples may participate that. Even Netflix may participate in that as well. So as these Tesla, I think, reports this week, and Netflix, Netflix is a big one because it had such a fall with uh, uh, dropping subscribers after COVID or when, when we came back out after COVID anyway. So they had changed some of their format to ad-based. And, and uh, so the, the viewerships and how they've been able to crack down on password sharing that they used to encourage – but uh, we know because we, we were one of those who used to share our passwords with our families, but and they did encourage that. But now they're cracking down on that. So how did that impact subscriptions? And so all of these company earnings, to me, is kind of like a, a side. It's like, hey, we can we can finally focus on something other than what's the economic data, what's the jobs report, the bad news is good news, all that stuff that I'm sure everybody's so tired of hearing and talking about. And it's still the main thing. But we get a break this week with some with corporate earnings and earnings season. Yeah, uh, picking up on that, Phil. I was reading Barron's this morning, and uh, there's uh, I think eight companies that call them the Wonderful Eight or the Magnificent Eight or something eight that does include Tesla, Netflix, Amazon, and uh, five others. But they said they have fun, uh, they have a ex- uh, very large disproportionate amount of leverage, something like thirty yeah. percent leverage on the market itself. Is it unusual that we have so many large companies reporting out the same week. Uh, no, they, they normally because they're all about the they're in the same kind of sector. If you really look at the largest companies now that have some form of technology associated with them, uh, those are the biggest companies in the world. Now, when we go back 20 years ago, and I wish I could find a link to this as soon because I thought it was amazing, but it was just the the 10 largest companies in the United States and how it changed from year to year to year. And, you know, Microsoft being the only one that was there 10, 15, 20 years ago that is still there because the rest of them have left and new ones have entered in, you know, like Tesla and, and Apple and, and some of these technology companies. So it's, it's not necessarily unusual because they all have some sort of uh, – they all kind of fit into the same categories. And, yeah, I, th- I, think it's, I think it's cool to look at Amazon. You know, Amazon to me – is such a beast, and you can you could make it a case for it falling in so many different asset classes. It could fall in technology because it's a it's a web based purchasing system. It could fall into technology. It could fall into consumer staples because of the things that you're you're able to platform that you're able to purchase on there. It could fall into consumer discretionary. Because and the the cool thing about Amazon is it doesn't really matter the economic environment. Your, your reliance or, or our reliance upon Amazon to get us those, those goods doesn't really – that doesn't change. It's what we're purchasing from them kind of changes. So I think a lot of these companies that now stretch across a few different platforms, Tesla, te- you could say Tesla is a, a technology company or is an auto, automotive company and, and what impacts these companies. So the fact that they, they've all got they – can, they can make a case to fit in – multiple asset classes or um, or or sectors, I don't think it's out of the ordinary that they all fall in the same week. 
but it, it does make the week interesting for sure. Phil, you have been very consistent over the last uh, several months, several years, saying that the the earnings, corporate earnings, drive the market more than anything else. Uh, counter to that is, I've always heard that the the market does uh, uh, crave stability, and it it reacts negative to instability. If we ever have a period in the last several decades of instability, it's now, this week, with the problems we're having in Israel, the problems that we do not have a functional uh, House of uh, Representatives in Congress. There's th These are the two big things, but there's other elements as well that kind of feeds on the instability. Yet, it seems like the market is following what you've been saying more so than the old adage about the instability because the market's responded very positive and it, it, with anticipation of good earnings. Yeah, and if you look at and when we say instability, it brings about volatility. And, you know, one of the well, – I, I think one of my oldest daughter used to tease me about saying this. Volatility isn't always a bad thing. You know, when markets go up in quick, in quick paces – well, that's a volatile market, but it's good because they're going up. Uh, the, the hard thing is, is when they're going down, it typically crashes even harder. So instability brings about volatility. And even the most aggressive of investors, you know, you don't necessarily want volatility. You would rather see a half a percent or a quarter percent increase on a daily basis opposed to 2 and 3% swings one way or the other. And we have to, you know, investor behavior, or consumer behavior, and how we internalize uh, market movements, whether it be for a week, a month, or quarter. We remember the bad times. We we all remember the bad times. We all remember, or if you look at your statement during COVID, you remember that five week drop. And we all have stories about 2008 and 2009, and and back in in the dot com uh, bubble in, in 2000. So you, we all remember those. But we don't remember the the really good quarters, the really good months, the really good weeks. We don't that doesn't tend to hang with us, other than that high water mark that we kind of compare our portfolios to. So you're you're right. In the long run, uh, instability brings about volatility, but eventually the the markets will always come back to corporate earnings. And we've always said this. You know, when something happens in in our markets, whether it's political or whether it's a natural disaster. Uh, inflation, the economic cycle. This is part of the economic cycle. It may be a little bit more drastic than what we used to see, but you know, this inflation going up and us increasing rates and and trying to damage our kind of our, our employment market right now, at least a little bit, trying to crack it just a little bit. That's all part of the economic cycle, and it's normal. However, right now it's just a little bit. Uh, it's a little bit sharper than what we had seen before coming out of COVID. But the markets do revert back to corporate earnings. So through all of these events, you know, one thing to, to kind of ease your mind, you have to bring it back to does that mean companies won't make money? Does that mean uh, corporations can't be profitable? And we've seen this time and time again, that they find a way to be profitable. They find a way to make money. It doesn't always make us happy. You know, think of shrinkflation. Uh, when we go into the stores and now we've got less cereal in our boxes or less bread in our bag or whatever it may be. That is that is a means for them to turn a profit. It drives me insane. It drives everyone insane. You know what happened to my 12 servings? Now it's only eight servings and and a half a gallon of milk really isn't a half gallon of milk anymore. They just changed the the shape of a, a of a container or or whatever it is that, that that we purchase. But those are the ways that companies turn profit, and we do need companies to make money. I mean, we have to we have to have companies make money. Number one, to exist to still get us what we need, but number two, to support our retirements, whether you're on a pension or if it's a 401K, I think we would all agree that it's not reasonable or, or advisable anyway to just rely upon Social Security. Not that we don't think Social Security will be there, but to keep pace with the cost of living and to be able to sustain and live through emergencies are really good things that could happen, that, but sometimes they cost money, and if you're just living off Social Security, that won't work, so you need some type of pension or 401k, and those are supported by the stock market, which is supported by companies making money. And it does all revert back to that eventually. It may not be the sexiest headline, and that's kind of why this week it's it's going to be a, a, a reprieve, short-lived, but it's going to be a reprieve, hopefully, a reprieve from the same old stories, all these things that you had just had mentioned, 
that does bring about instability in our markets and brings about volatility. And quite honestly, it's getting to me, it's getting kind of old. I'd like to talk about something else. So hopefully this week the, the, the corporate earnings give us something else to talk about. But you're, the point you're making, Phil, is on the long term. Uh, the point I was trying to make is that on a very, very, very short term, for just a period of two or three days, it appears that, at least at this moment in time, it appears that the earnings trumps the insta- prospects of instability. It does this week, yeah, it does, and and because of the like the point that you had brought up, the size of these these earnings that we're getting ready to see, the, the companies that we're getting ready to see, and I think there's a lot of underlying hope that they had done better what expectations kind of led us to, to to believe. So the, these their their expected earnings uh, were were hoping have been shattered. Now let's look back. Why why have those expected earnings? Why have they been beaten? Well, the consumer is much stronger than what we anticipated earlier in the year. The job market is much stronger than what we anticipated. The job market is so strong right now, it's become an issue in some sorts for the Federal Reserve in the battle against inflation. However, for this week, because consumers have been strong and because consumers have been supported more so than what was expected anyway, supported with higher wages and employment, their abilities to purchase from these companies and companies to profit off of it have they're expecting it to be better than than what they were uh just a few months ago bill thursday will mark 36 years since black monday hit where the dow jones industrial average dropped over 22 percent in one day it was preceded i didn't realize that yeah preceded by three days of uh intense selling to begin with and uh, pent-up pressure over the weekend led to a major sell-off of the Dow and other markets as well. And I'm looking at the numbers in researching this. Um, Steve Boykin was talking about an experience he had where his broker had contacted him and said, I don't like the way things are looking, sell. And uh, I'm looking at the, the report on this. It says, during a strong five-year bull market, the Dow Jones Industrial Average rose – from 776 in August of 1982 to a peak of 2722 in August of 1987. And uh, again, the drop in the Dow ultimately was 508 points, 22 point, I think, uh, 6% of what it was at that time. And as you look at the market today, Phil, even with as unstable as it has been over the last couple of months, the Dow is at 34,015 or 16, depending on the second that you look at it. So this is 2023. We're at 34,000. That day, it was in the mid-2000s, and then it dropped under uh, because of the 22% sell-off. And if you were just starting your working career and you had just begun maybe a couple of years of working and putting money into a 401K or an IRA and whatever, and you were socking it away, and you look at that that day at loss, you'd be like, where'd my money go? And and maybe you were 23 when you started, and now you're 60. I don't know. Maybe that's my exact age parameters I'm setting up there. The Dell is 17 times now what it was that day, even if you had bought at the peak and endured the 500-point sell-off, which is a testament to time and patience. Yes, and, we, and you know, another another tired saying that we have that we say often is you need one of two things. Uh, you either need a lot of time or you need a lot of money. So in the scenario that you just gave us, that person had a lot of time, and they would have been rewarded if they didn't try to time the market. So they just would have stayed calm and realized that this is short-lived, this is short-term, and the sun will come up again tomorrow, which it, 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 it's proven time and time again. It, it always does, regardless of the volatility and the instability, like like to periods like right now. And I'm just wondering, you know, the, the instability that, that we see right now with all the headlines and all the things, I think that's more common, and we could expect that. When When will we ever see calm waters again, whether it's internationally or – on the economic front, or there'll always be some fear, even after a bull run or during a bull run. There's a lot of fear about when's it going to fall, when's it going to fall. We know it's going to fall eventually, 
but timing that is what is so dangerous. It's dangerous for everyone because if you get out, when exactly do you get back in? It, it truly is been proven time and time again to just put your blinders on and do and, and, and use the example that you just used in weather the storm. Of course, that works better for a 24 year old than it does for an 84 year old. <laughs> it does, and they should be they should be positioned. The 84 year old should be yeah. pos- positioned a little differently, depending on what their goals are. Bill, how do we reach you for more information today? You can reach us at 304-263-4343 or stop by and see us with an appointment at 1270 Winchester Avenue right here in Martinsburg. Thank you, Phil. Have a great day, sir. Thank you, guys. You too.